That's prime dirty macking right there. When the whole time Pastor Dow wanted her, and we know that because he ended up taking her. She is now his wife, and she was married at the time. If I was committing adultery, what business is it of yours? Now, what business is it of yours anyway? It's not your life. Some of the things I spoke on, you know, it wasn't none of my damn business. <laughs> Hey guys, before we continue, I found that 63% of you who watch these videos are not subscribed. Click that subscribe button to support truth and click the like button to keep these videos circulated within the YouTube algorithm. Thank you for your support and truth. Let's get back I'm to I'm on it. a new level right, right now. And this level is beyond my personal beliefs. Okay. Before we continue, I will lay the framework for this video. First, I will break down the hypocrisy of new breed from several points of view. But staying on point, later I will break down the difference between King Solomon's wives and this modern counterfeit practice of polygyny that Dirty Low Dow and new breed pretend to convey. Also, I will break down how it relates to the transatlantic slave trade. In the mid to late portion of the video, I will feature scriptures and will upload a separate version. So this version will have scriptures and it will have the backstory and the continuing saga of New Breed and the whole situation that revolves around him and UP Farms and Dirty Low Dow. But the second video that I will upload will only contain the scriptures, breaking down the false doctrine of polygyny King Solomon's wives, the transatlantic slave trade, and more. Now, I believe New Breed switched it up and changed his energy toward Dirty Low Dow, and I believe he may capitulate to Dirty Low Dow as the so called emperor of UP Farms because New Breed, Yawitaza, and the landowner Mike, they just don't know what they're doing. I mentioned this in a video about three months ago. And also, we need to talk about the peril and hypocrisy that comes with Newbury associating himself potentially with Dirty Low Dow once again. There is no doubt that Dow has the knowledge, experience, manpower, resources, and pocketbooks to turn UP Farms into an entity within one year. But at what cost to Newbury, who is obviously overly concerned about his brand? In addition to that, guys like myself are able to produce the receipts of New Breed exposing the adultery of Dirty Low Dow and the child abuse that was committed by one of his pastors, Daniel Mir, a few months ago. But more importantly, New Breed will be at the mercy of a man who has proven himself to be a ruthless tyrant. And Dow will own New Breed in these YouTube streets if he ever does associate himself with this dude. Furthermore, New Breed is still on the hook, needing to explain how he will deal with white supremacy. Remember, one of the investors in the land is a Caucasian woman, and I do not believe she intends to share any power with New Breed. Later in this video, I will talk about how white supremacy is the first layer, the matrix, and many white supremacists will panic when they witness the judgments of the Most High and Revelation manifest before their very eyes. Remember, New Breed likes to use the end time prophecies to justify the gathering of blended communities when the Most High never commanded us to do that. But more on that later. Let's go back. To what Newbury called the most important stream he has ever done. Let's introduce first the men who were present at this live stream four months ago, as well as those who were not there, but Newbury was still relying on their financials and their audience to support and industrialize UP firms, but more importantly, to swell his own pockets. So, joining Newbury at this live stream conference was Mark the Messenger whom many believe Newbury's message was directed toward because he has more than twice as many subscribers than everyone on that panel and the individuals I'll mention who were not present but heavily involved in prompting the land initiative conveying the message to their respective audiences. Mark the Messenger 
never attached his name to the land initiative for a variety of reasons probably but i do recall mark the messenger commenting here on my channel about the lack of credibility that ringo tv and new breed has reading what mark the messenger had to say in his own words he said those warlocks lie i never took anyone's side but instead of trying to clear up my name wasting time I'll let the Most High deal with them. Now, I understand that you're trying to distance yourself from Ringo TV and New Breed, but Mark the Messenger, these men claim that you owed them something because they promoted your channel and played the role in the growth of your channel before you blew up. And you said nothing about them being warlocks at that time, so why are you saying this now? Okay, but that's a whole other video. Check this out. Eric Gonzalez, technically, is the reason why all these men are here, and I'll explain. Dirty Lodal slept with this man's wife and continues to perpetually live in adultery with her. Ringo TV, to his credit, did get this man's story, Eric Gonzalez, he did get his story out to the public. But if you hear all the bad things Ringo TV has to say about New Breed today, you would think Ringo TV would have rebuked New Breed at that time for using Eric Gonzalez's divorce for his own selfish ambitions instead of joining New Breed for what they call business matters is separating church and state. Now that they fell out, they want to be all about the scriptures again. So without Eric Gonzalez, Dirty Low Dow, and even Pastor Rufus, who was evicted by Dow from Straightway, Georgia, without these three men, New Breed would have no reason to initiate this meeting. Particularly, New Breed was using the fact that Dow has no morality in stealing Gonzalez's wife to somehow suggest that UP Farms will be a better, safer place for the people to dwell at than that was at Straightway. But earlier, you heard him say it wasn't none of my damn business hypocrite now i don't understand why newbury switched his tone on dow other than to covertly potentially seek some advice from him on how to get this thing up off the ground because i'm on record saying that it will cost them at least 25 million dollars to make up farms a reality to industrialize the landscape without the expertise and manpower and financials they currently don't have. Also, I may add, even if all the men who were on this panel, even if all of them contributed their financial support and the support of their audience, I still believe it will be an incredibly difficult thing to accomplish. Pastor Rufus was there because Dow defamed this man's character and he used to be one of Dirty Low Dow's hype men. Rufus I believe just wanted to contribute and teach New Breed any knowledge he has about building communities so they can become a prime competitor to Dirty Low Dow in the Israelite community. But now New Breed has maliciously, publicly spited Rufus by pacifying Dow. Nevertheless, Rallo was also present at this conference, and currently Rallo is also at odds against New Breed as well as Brainwaves, who was not present at the meeting. Finally, there is Brother Karadazar, whom Nubri called the Poodle Face Elder. Correct me if I'm wrong, but when Karadazar rebuked Mark the Messenger, he expressed some words about the false doctrine of polygyny. I have to go back and watch the tapes again, but I do recall him saying this. During this meeting, though, Karadazar's face said a thousand words when Newbury suggested that there is to be a separation of church and state. I do not know what doctrine Karadazar subscribes to regarding our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but I just hope he at least believes Jesus Christ is God, because that's all that matters. What does Christ want? But I've been hearing that this brother comes from one of these Israelite camps, uh, One West, I believe, and they do not believe Jesus Christ is God. But if anyone in the chat want to correct me, let me know 
if he believes Jesus Christ is God. Or Brother Karadazar, you can let me know if you believe Jesus Christ is God. But let's get to these clips. Do we have it in us as so-called men of truth, men of the most high? Do we have it in us to put resources together to make something real happen? That's what I want to know. Seriously, I, I seriously want to know this. I'm questioning the men of the most high. Now, I'm going to say this now. I'm going to react to this material, and I want to let this be known off the break. I'm not here to galvanize brothers, and I'm not here to show any condemnation towards brothers, but I am here to challenge you, brothers. I am here to challenge you. I'm here to challenge you. Translation. I'm here to challenge you to give me some money, particularly you, Mark the Messenger. I'm challenging you to give me some money. So keep in mind, you know, I'm going to keep it 100% in this video, and it is what it is, right? Let's go. And fellas, I, I wanted to uh, quickly give some closing sentiments because I'm coming across some time constraints, and I wanted to say some things and, uh, and just put, put some information out there for all the fellas on the panel. I don't know if all of you all may be aware, but we also have a land initiative development community that we're working on. Now, speaking on Dow and Straightway's influence, a lot of brothers really looked up to the communal part of what Straightway was doing. And uh, we've, we've been disappointed by all of this. We, we've seen how Brother Jamie was treated, Mr. Gonzalez, as well as Pastor Rufus. See what he just said there will contradict what he says next. He said Dow mistreated Rufus and Gonzalez, implying that UP Farms will do better. And, um, you know, we were discouraged for a while because we said, man, this is how communities is ran. You know, we we knew to this. We had infant stages of development. You know, all we got, we got a couple of wells dug. We got some generators on there. We got a couple of trailers, a couple of RVs. Um, there is a livable structure there that um, has uh, a, a lady built a small home. And um, one thing that we, we've learned through all of this is that we wanted to learn from the mistakes of these fallible men. Uh, now, let me make this clear. Straightway didn't do everything wrong. Them having community is important. And I'm going to be 100% where everybody viewing right now. You know, Dow, he made a stream and he talked about how they have a community, how they're together, how if something was to hit the fan, then they good. And I actually agree with what he said, regardless of how we feel about, you know, whatever extramarital affairs he got, which I'm in total disagreement with. I'm in total disagreement with how it's ran over there. Um, I'm in total disagreement with a lot of things. That's going on. The man is a, is, a, is a cult leader, if you ask me, just to keep it, uh, you know, straightforward, which is the man's a cult leader and he's wicked. But with the combination of all the men that can gather like we did last night, we're talking about well over a million subscribers combined, well over a million subscribers combined. And that's something that we should really put into consideration. Let's go. Um, who want to lead and be Judas goats. And what we decided to do is kind of separate church and state. Um, because what, what we've learned is with all these religious institutions, it seems that somebody's ego is going to get in the way. And you hear what I'm saying here. It's time that we ch separate church and state. It's time that we separate church and state. That's one of the dumbest things you can say. You see the look on Karadazar's face and how his eyebrows went up. Newbury could not sense the enmity on the stream. They are all there for different reasons. If you're talking about separating church and state, even from a business perspective, that's going to hurt Mark the Messenger, Pastor Rufus, and Karadazar because their platforms are built off the scriptures. But in Newbury's mind, the common unity in his mind is that we all got a bunch of subscribers that amount to one million. But he doesn't realize that even Eric Gonzalez talks about the scriptures. And really, they're all there once again because... Dirty Low Dow slept with Eric Gonzalez's wife and took her up in marriage. So church and state revolves around morality. That's why it's something called the courts of men and the courts of heaven. It's something called the great white throne judgment. Man has his penal system and the most high has the lake of fire. Okay? Church and state has never been separate. The minute someone owes you some money and don't pay up, that's even more an issue of the church because it's sin, rather it's business or not. Again, that's why these Negroes, Newbury and Ringo TV brought out the scriptures after they fell out. But I will play and commentate a few more clips, one by Newbury and the other by Dow. Then we'll get into the scriptures. And honestly, I'm mad enough to say a lot of the things, not all the things, not even a lot, but some of the things I spoke on, 
You know, it wasn't none of my damn business. And so I can correct myself and be like, you know what? I was riding with the squad. I was riding with the team. And I went out there and I said some things that really wasn't my damn business at the end of the day. And I learned from that. I'm like, I'm going to mind my business. Even if my squad and my team, they own one thing, there ain't no need to join along because, you know, you just want to be supportive of your squad at the end of the day because that's how I always been. I always ride with the squad, you know. You are obligated to ride with truth in the scriptures because the Most High will hold you accountable. What's going on with Dow is your business because, first of all, he made his adultery public. And secondly, you once supported this heathen. But I was like, you know what? I'm mad enough to look at it from the outside looking in and be like, you know, man, it is what it is. Dow ain't no perfect man. But Pastor Dow's a better man than Ringo. Bet your bottom dollar that. He's a much better man than Ringworm. Regardless of his faults. I don't care damn what nobody say about that. Because I guess what? I can look at Pastor Dow and see what he's built. And if y'all don't like that, it is what it is. I don't Both Ringo TV and Dow are wicked. But there are levels to wickedness. Dirty Low Dow is over a decade older than Ringo TV, and he has destroyed so many lives while taking on the title of pastor. Ringo TV never thinks twice before he speaks because he's just here to earn a check from YouTube. But Dirty Low Dow wants to earn a check, he wants to steal your check, and he wants to finesse your wife. I mean, how much pound of flesh does this wicked bastard want to take? He is undoubtedly the undisputed demon of the year. So let's be objective here. Him building communities don't mean nothing if his congregates must learn how to live with demons on the land. Now I understand you're at odds with Ringo TV, but do not be biased because you're considering paying Dow some money for manpower and his advice on how to till the land. It is my opinion that Newbury has too big of an ego to just hand everything to Dirty Low Dow so he can get all the credit. But I can see Dirty Low Dow communicating with Newbury behind the scenes for some sort of agreement. But again, what matters most is that y'all niggas need to come into agreement with Jesus Christ before it's too late, man. And Mark the Messenger, you know, I did my rebuke on Mark the Messenger. He made it clear he don't want nothing to do with the brothers, and I'm cool with that too, because I feel the same way. But I do hope Mark learned something from what I said. You know what I'm saying? I hope he did learn something from what I said, though. Somebody said, now nah, he mad at Mark. I ain't mad at Mark. I spoke my piece on Mark on this channel. Go look at the video. Message to Mark the Messenger. You can't play the gray area. Look at it. Watch the video. What? I'm not mad at Mark. I respect Mark that he got up and out of this damn Israelite community. My only thing is he shouldn't have been, he shouldn't have been responding to the poodle face elder. You know, the he shouldn't have been responding to that Pomeranian face elder. The Phineas and Ferb looking elder. He shouldn't even have jumped on there. You don't owe that nigga no explanation. You ain't a part of these churches. You ain't a part of them. Wow. The Poodle-Faced Elder. <laughs> now, I watched part of that encounter between Mark the Messenger and Karadazar, and to be honest, Mark should have not ran away like that because I watched Pastor Rufus maintain his composure when he was grilled by the Elder, and he was on his show for at least two hours. But I think Karadazar could have led more with Mark's stance on polygyny because that's more of a serious matter. I ain't responding to none of them because they nothing. They failures. They used to be camps. They feel like we don't know nothing anyway and we just ignorant ass grandbabies of the One West chant camps 
these niggas, all they talk about how they were slaying dragons and lions out there on the block and all that. And how they was preaching and all, I don't care, man. I don't want to hear none of that. I don't have no respect for none of y'all. How about that? And y'all ain't my damn elders. I don't go to your church, niggas. You know what I'm saying? Oh, shit, Sioux face elders. The elder, yeah, the elder was out of pocket. Gonna talk about that man's message and what he talking about. If you don't like what he talking about, why don't you speak the gospel and put out something that's better than what he talking about, nigga? Tired of you old ass failures trying to get, trying to get a name for yourself. Y'all time is over. When my time over, I know my time over. The thing I hate about these camps is they do not believe Jesus Christ is God, and most of them do not believe in an eternal lake of fire. Now here's a clip that's very telling about. Now, and how he strategically structures his communities. Because remember, New Breed was very vague about who can come on the land. And of course, we know there is already a Caucasian investor. So, New Breed has not been thorough about how things will operate on the land, blended communities coming on the land, especially in a time of martial law. When, again, as I stated, and I'll repeat later in this video when I go through the scriptures, there's a judgment that's coming on the Caucasian people because of their affliction against God's chosen people in the transatlantic slave trade. And New Breed does not take these things into account. We've had some serious racist stuff. Can you imagine somebody driving down the road, creeping, and taking their time, and turning around, I mean, going way out of their way, sometimes coming from other counties, to drive down there, even though they're on camera, and then drive off and hollering all type of obscenities and profanity, and, and, and then hollering all kind of niggas just left and right and right and left and right, almost damn near about ready to kill themselves running into a tree to get up out of there. And I told you, somebody gonna do that one day. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, Teacher Shane was at Walmart one day, and, um, and, and, and somebody came up to Teacher Shane and said, why did y'all kill that man? I said, isn't that amazing? We had nothing to do with nothing with nobody, but we do return curses, right? And what they're talking about is there's this guy that he drove off of the main road, turned on to the road that's almost adjacent to the road that where we live. And every time you go past that, you go, there's no way in hell. There's only one tree on that road. How do you run smack dab in that tree? How do you do it? I mean, you get, how do you run into that tree? There's just no way humanly possible to accept something going on. And he hits his tree and he kills himself. And automatically, people associate his death, even though he ran into the tree and he killed himself. Automatically, they associate his, his death saying that we did it. Because I told you, there ain't no laws in spiritual warfare on this earth that they can convict you by. Because we, we ought to pray for Father Killer. I'll tell you flat out, we did kill them that are against us in our person. If somebody was to come down there and run into a damn tree, and, and I'm telling you, they could be setting up there and, 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 and they could be on fire. You know what I would do? I would go down there to my house, call the sheriff's department. Somebody done came down here and hollered a bunch of profanities and obscenities and ran into a tree and then a, and then a car caught on fire and it blew up. Y'all need to come out there and get them. Oh, passed out. You wouldn't try to get them out. Hell no. They get adjustment now. Then they get adjustment when in eternity when they burning in hell. Why should I go over there and help my enemy like that? Who doesn't mean me no good? There's a pecking order, a racial hierarchy at Straightway under Dow. I mean, he doesn't talk about it much. But Dow has read the scriptures and he knows the Gentiles will have to serve Jacob. This is a man whom I'm sure experienced a lot of racism when he served this country, the U.S. Airborne, I believe. And when he returned home in the towns nearby in southern Tennessee, he also experienced racism. I do not believe that Dow trusts a white man like that. Most of the leaders in his community are black men. Even he understands. You can't just invite anyone on your land because Dow does build communities. He builds them for real. And he even told stories of how he chased some white trespassers off of his land. So New Breed is just trying to copy something that he already seen has been done. But he doesn't understand that Dow did not use YouTube to launch his communities because he understands the barbaric nature of white supremacists because we all know Dow is a self-interested dude for all his faults. Some say R.G. Stare gave him the land. I do not believe this because 
thou would still have to maintain the land. And that's a lot of property to manage. Okay, he still has to recruit guys to work for him. And it's a lot of work. I mean, I'm not going to take that away from him. But what does it good for a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Okay. But thou did suggest a new breed to swallow his pride and come and learn from him. Nevertheless, I believe anyway in martial law, in a grid down situation, the U.S. and foreign militaries will use eminent domain to establish checkpoints in the cities and strategically target communities like Straightway. So a lot of the things that he's showing you on video with all of his guns, that's all just a facade. Okay. When the SHTF, it's not going to be like anything you can imagine. The scriptures say that man will seek death and not find it. So you just got to study to show yourself approved and pray to the most high to keep you in those times. That's why he said those who forsake land and houses for his name's sake shall inherit eternal life and he'll make a way. He said, pray that you be worthy to escape all the judgments that's coming upon this place and the eternal wrath of God. All right. So at this point in the video, I'm going to cover the transatlantic slave trade and polygyny uh, through white supremacy, how all of this is connected. Again, this will be a separate video for those of you who just want to hear the scriptures. One of the greatest misconceptions some Israelites convey toward the concept of monogamy is that it was concocted by Europeans to fragment black communities while simultaneously facilitating and augmenting the systemic exploits and power dynamics of white supremacy. Although this matriarchal Babylonian kingdom is satanic, those who credit Europeans for inventing monogamy dismiss one contradiction. Polygyny will actually strengthen the hand of white supremacists through the landscape and tentacles of this matriarchal beast system. For example, it is common sense that if polygyny was widely accepted, the government could make more money through divorce settlements more than through monogamy. The cooperation and submissiveness of the woman is influenced by matriarchal cohorts, but determined by the woman. Matthew 7.16 says, by their fruits, you will know them. In other words, a generation of whoremongering women who do not keep their virgin for one man show you they are not worthy of polygyny anymore. We don't look at the men because men were not defiled by the serpent's seed in the beginning. Because those who champion polygyny argue that the Most High would not have created men to produce offspring deep into his years if he did not want him to practice polygyny perpetually. Well. I will counter that again with fruit. First of all, the power of self-control lies in the overcoming of temptation. That's just like saying God created the woman to be the most beautiful among all his creatures. Therefore, she should exploit this gift with different men. God has given athletes the gift to make millions playing professional sports, knowing that men will exalt themselves as gods in turn. I mean, I can go on and on. It would not be a sacrifice if the thing we sacrifice is not appealing to the flesh. Because if men spent all his years producing seed, he would never fast and he would never present his body a living sacrifice to the Lord. And actually, the older you get, the more you're supposed to fast because fasting is death and you're moving closer to death. During the transatlantic slave trade, our people were not able to do either. They were not permitted to establish an altar and worship the Most High whenever they wanted. And they could produce as many sons as they want, but those boys were auctioned to the white man's plantation. Is that being fruitful and multiply? No. Joel 3 verse 3 says they gave a boy as payment for a harlot. So producing seed is a blessing and a curse. Producing fruit is more important than producing seed. 
What's the point of producing a whole bunch of babies if they grow old and face the eternal wrath of God? So we cannot look at polygyny through the lens of producing seed. It's all about producing fruits. The fruit is in the field and is picked from a tree. The field of women are mostly harlots today. You cannot turn a harlot into a housewife. In Matthew 16, 4, Christ said, This is a wicked and adulterous generation. In 1 Corinthians 7, verse 2, Paul said, Because of sexual immorality, let every man have his own wife and every woman her own husband. In other words, it is immoral not only for a man to lay with another man's wife, but for the people in that city to allow that man an adulterous woman to live. Remember, the Apostle Paul said, The letter of the law killeth. The law of jealousy killeth. But Paul understood through the spirit of Christ that there is no way you can fulfill this law under captivity to the Romans. And those who support polygyny cannot use King Solomon because you got to look at his fruit, not his seed. Look at King Solomon's fruit. Despite the flaws of King Solomon's escapades, he had 700 wives and all of them had to be virgins exclusive to him. I mean, think about that. That is one of the greatest testaments against this modern counterfeit practice of polygyny. Here's the king of Israel with 700 wives, all of them virgins, and all of them subjected to the law of jealousy, meaning if any one of them committed adultery, they would be stoned to death. That was the pinnacle of patriarchal rule that does not exist today. When did the law end? When Christ manifested in the flesh. Let's go to John chapter 8, verse 1 through 12. Verse 1, it says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So he was basically writing out their sins, possibly in some sand, so that they could read it, and they were convicted. So he's setting them up here. Verse 7, So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Verse 11, she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Verse 12, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. That's how you know also that Jesus Christ is God. A man cannot forgive sins. Even though the Pharisees were convicted of their sins, Jesus Christ is the only one that can forgive sins on earth. So if he was just a regular man, he cannot speak to them with that authority. That's why they were convicted in their conscience. Because man was made in the image and likeness of God. The scriptures say we, we, we were fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay, so Christ just nullified the law right there. What they don't talk about is how polygyny went away also. So 
there's a law of grace. The woman was given grace, but under the law of Moses, she wouldn't have been given that grace because she's bound to the law. The letter of the law killeth. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's obviously not the case today, despite the fact that white supremacists practice this with their penal system. They do eye for an eye, for the most part. And remember in the scriptures, which I'll touch on later, scriptures say, judge not that you be not judged also. That's what that's talking about. <laughs> it's talking about those who actually take life for life, or God will take your life, or he will judge you in the great white throne judgment, okay? Because not everyone get their judgment in this time. So anyway, when Christ said what he said up to that point, again, women were being stoned to death for adultery. Christ didn't say she has the option to be a man's concubine. See, you polygynists can't have your cake and eat it too. Why did Christ take away that part of the law that would sanction a death penalty to adulterers, knowing that was the only deterrent to the perpetual practice of adultery? Because he was already in the midst of an adulterous generation. They could no longer keep the law of Moses because they were no longer putting people to death. Furthermore, more importantly, not practicing the sacrifices, the consecrations, because Jerusalem had already went into captivity. Also, again, Jesus Christ, who is God, he knew the transatlantic slave trade was in store for the Israelites, and many whoredoms and abominations would be committed against his chosen people. So, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is reiterating what Christ conveyed in John chapter 8, Matthew 7, 16, and Matthew 16, 4. Divorce and abortion and promiscuity is the fruit of this adulterous generation. Again, we're looking at the state of the woman. We're looking at fruits, okay? We're looking at the virtue of the woman, along with the consecrations and the penal system sanctioned under the law of Moses to determine the sanctity of polygyny. And at this point in the teaching, I will segue into how this relates to white supremacy. So abortion, divorce, and promiscuity, I've already established, these are the fruits of this adulterous matriarchal age. But white supremacy spearheaded all of this wickedness. And again, the first layer of the matrix is white supremacy. And because white supremacists are fraudulent in their interpretation of the scriptures, they lied about Matthew chapter 7, 1 through 3, that judgment is to verbally rebuke someone of the sin you practice. Therefore, that person's being a hypocrite. No, it doesn't only refer to that. It refers to changing or compromising the life or even taking the life of someone because you're judging them for a sin that they committed. That's what Matthew 7, 1 through 3 is referring to primarily. But in John chapter 8, the scribes and Pharisees were about to judge the adulterous woman. They were about to judge her by putting her to death. Now, ask this. Why did white supremacists pacify the real meaning of judgment? Because every day they judge men according to their own penal code, and they are hypocrites. But before I elaborate further, let me address those of you white folks who are righteous. Your righteousness cannot stand in place as a ransom for the overhaul of wickedness of your forefathers and all that they have done and the evil this generation of Edomites continue to incorporate. The blood of Jesus does not cover the sin they wish to live in the comforts of their homes off the bloodshed of our forefathers, okay? The blood of Jesus covers repentance. Well, what about the black people? Listen, we were judged for our disobedience with the transatlantic slave trade and all the afflictions of the prison industrial complex, eugenics, castration, Jim Crow, and so much more. Reading from Jeremiah 15.1, it says, then the Lord said to me, this is Jeremiah the prophet speaking, even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, my mind would not be favorable toward this people. 
talking about the Jews. He continues, he says, send them out of my sight. You see that? Even the righteousness of Jesus Christ, although it does redeem man's sins through repentance, the men who are reprobate and continue to practice wickedness without repenting, the blood of Jesus don't cover them. They go straight to the lake of fire. So that's a word for you so-called righteous white folk. Okay, no man's righteousness. The scriptures say all our, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Okay, you got to pay for the sins of your forefathers. This is why Christ emphasized death to self in the new covenant, because he understood the burden of the sins of our forefathers, which according to Deuteronomy 5, 9, passed down up to the third and fourth generation. So let's read from Luke chapter 14, verse 26 through 33. It says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, this does not mean literally hate them. Okay, it just means if the unfortunate time comes where that line in the sand is drawn between your relationship with them and your relationship with the Most High, you better choose the Most High. Okay, he said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father who is in heaven. Okay, I've been tested with this many times, many times in my life. I kid you not. Verse 27, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. That's deep stuff. And remember, he also said your righteousness must exceed the Pharisees. And remember, the Pharisees were self-righteous because they were fasting. Okay. The sacrifices of God is a broken and contrite spirit. So instead of making your claim that you had nothing to do with the sins of your forefathers, you understand that Proverbs 6.31 says if the thief is found, he must restore sevenfold. So if you know there was death, there's documented proof that reparations are owed, the bill is passed down to you. And that's what most white supremacists don't understand is that man cannot outlive his sins. His sins are passed down to his children. Okay. The book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 12, says, Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed and establishes a city by iniquity. It does not say anything about the man who committed the initial offense because the Most High understand that man's life is only a vapor, according to Giants chapter 4, verse 14, and Job 14, 1 and 2, which says man is few of days and full of trouble, okay? So, again, man cannot outlive his sins. So, the Most High got to do what? He got to pass it down to his children. You got to understand blood covenants. Isaiah 13, 16 says their children will be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be plundered and their wives ravished. This is where many will wonder how and why the Most High will allow the infants, the newborns, to be dashed to pieces. Well, we know the precious, innocent children go to heaven to be with him. The Most High is able to remove their precious soul from their body before harm comes to the flesh. So you're probably wondering, what's the point of this? Who is this hurting? 
their children being dashed before their eyes. It is a torment to live in the memory of the parents, those Edomites who gave a boy for a harlot. You got to read the scriptures. This is why Revelation 9, 6 says man will seek death and not find it. All these scriptures are tied to Matthew 7, 1 through 3 and John chapter 8. Judgment is reserved for our oppressors and their descendants who judge for the sake of unrighteous mammon. White supremacy is a packaged deal. The books got to be balanced and your debt is unsettled. Some have called for reparations, which will not suffice. Some things just got to be paid back in blood. Okay. Yes, if the reparations were paid, maybe the most high, and if they repented, maybe the most high wouldn't make this judgment harsh. But the fact that it's written in the scriptures is telling. Okay, it has to come to pass if it's written in the scriptures because the Most High cannot lie. Okay, let's read from Proverbs chapter 6, verse 32 through 35. It says, verse 32, whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. Wounds and dishonor he will get, and his reproach will not be wiped away. For jealousy, is a husband's fury. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will accept no recompense, nor will he be appeased, though you give many gifts. Some things cannot be spared in the day of vengeance. When the Gentiles scattered our people, called themselves by our name, and stole our homeland, we were no longer able to practice polygyny and all the consecrations God established for us under the law of Moses. So this right here, Proverbs 6, 32 through 35, is sort of a replicate of the Most High's jealousy, because the Most High is a husband, and Israel is his bride, his chosen people, his jewels. So those who committed adultery with her, raped her in the transatlantic slave trade, they're going to have to deal with the husband's fury. You see how the scriptures are cryptic? This is also why I do not recommend interracial marriages, which is a big part of this matrix deception. Our women fell in love with their oppressors due to self-hatred, which is idolatry. Also, you must understand that the judgments coming upon these heathen Edomites will not be spared just because they marry blacks or move into some common unity with blacks. If you have children with these heathens and they did not sell everything they own because it is cursed with innocent bloodshed, according to Deuteronomy 5, 9, the Most High visits this iniquity onto the children up to the third and fourth generations. Okay, it doesn't matter if they're mixed kids or if they're white. Okay, I hope you can see how polygyny was compromised by the transatlantic slave trade, but it is not the only sabotage to this practice. To hear more about how polygyny became perverted, watch my series titled Polygyny is a Package Deal. All right? Do I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? It's not personal, it's scripture. Okay? Don't let your flesh write checks. Your soul cannot cash in the afterlife. It's all about fates and gates. You got to have faith and you're going to need God's grace.